All right. Well, what I'm really getting at, though, is the way that dream works. It opens doors. Dreams work. They yes. open doors of perception, right? And psychedelics open doors of perception, and and have you know, and both of them, you know, it's lead to an intu intuition that is really important for people to be able to connect with, trust and intuition. Hi everyone, it's Raghu. I have this little intro to this new podcast that I wanted to share with you. Uh, it is, uh, first of all, a real joy to have uh, done a, a podcast with an old friend of mine. I've done several with him. He's been with us with Ram Dass and Maui at retreats. Uh, his name is John Lockley and he's a Sangoma uh, shaman from uh, South Africa, Botswana area. And uh, an amazing, amazing guy. And just a true blue, uh, substantial, as they say in Yiddish, mensch. John is a mensch. He's a just solid guy. Anyhow, uh, I'll t tell a little bit more about that, but uh, what's in, up in this podcast. But I wanted to also just uh, shout out. Got to do a shout out for people that are supporting us, a company that is supporting Be Here Now Network, and uh, its name is Magic Mind. And it is, uh, basically, it's a morning elixir and that uh, completely tunes you in. But I'm, I, I want to tell a little story first. So, my partner in life, whose name is Katrina, she got the box from Magic Mind of the, their small bottles, you know, individually, you drink one of them and they taste great. And I'm really critical about that. So they taste great. And uh, so the box came. I wasn't home. I didn't know the box came. She took the box she drank them all in a week. I had a week's collection of them. I'm going like, what happened there? I, I, was, I was trying to try out Magic Mind. And she goes, oh, I didn't know that. I thought this, I, I just thought this is something, once I took one, I just wanted to be doing it every day. <laughs> I go, well, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be doing something with this for the Be Here Now Network. So anyhow... Uh, I did, they, they were kind and sent another box and I uh, was able to, to, to try it myself and uh, it, it is pretty amazing uh, how it does tune you in in the morning and uh, yeah, around maybe just knocking back that stress that's going to come with your work day, your family day, your raising children day, your whatever day and uh and I love this aspect of it, which they do talk about. Uh, instead of Gatorade for athletes, it's Creatorade for creators. And I thought, okay, that fits perfectly. And um, so it's, it's a wonderful product. And it has uh, uh, just some of the essential, necessary, transformational uh, possibilities uh, that you, you know that you can take part in with a uh, an elixir elixir. So I urge you to try Magic Mind because I did, and my partner, of course, she just tried to grab it all from me. So uh, Magic Mind, you can go up and uh, and just Google them up and get over there and uh, find out where you can order it from. Okay, it'll be in the show notes as well, big time, links, all of it. So John Lockley, John, uh, it's just incredible. So his whole thing is these days is around really introducing people back to wilderness. And he takes people in the Kalahari, which I believe is in Botswana, maybe Botswana, South Africa, right in there, to the Kalahari, which has a lot, uh, several different... Um, uh, 
ecological zone, so to speak. Uh, it's, there is places where there's water holes and, and larger trees and so on and so forth. And then there's real desert with shrubs. Anyhow, he leads people out there, and the idea is to return back to a connection with nature, basically. And that's a, a big, big uh, offering from John. And uh, I think he takes people out several times a year. You can go to johnlockley.com and, and just tune in there. But um, the uh, we were just talking about different definitions of soul or Buddha mind or true nature, you know, everyone has a different uh, way in which they like to express the divine inside a human. And, uh, and he, I said, what's yours from, from the Sangoma tradition? And he goes, Umoya is the name. I said, wow, okay, beautiful name. What does it mean? Spirit wind is basically trans verbal from our soul their thing is umoya which means spirit wind now i love that as an analogy for what the deepest part of ourselves is huh spirit wind so and um i mean he as i mentioned you know it's it's all about connecting back to wilderness and uh in lieu of that, and you're living in the city and you're around the corner, well, Central Park is absolutely a huge, gorgeous place to connect back a little bit. But even a small park that has a, a, just a few trees is a way, you know, uh, to, to connect back. And, and, of course, if you could go to the Kalahari with John, unbelievable. They track animals uh, just just to follow their, their habitual life patterns and, and so on. I mean, just incredible uh, opportunity. Um, so it's, but the interesting thing for me is the premise that John has about connecting people back to the wilderness through our own inner wilderness. You know, that part of us that's completely free, not in fear, not in polarity, maybe so much and in tune with nature. So you, you have to connect in both ways, inside and out. And that's what I love about uh, his work. It's, it's just really wonderful. And uh, he, do, he does a, a lovely meditation at the end, by the way. Uh, really, really great. And I call it trust in the heartbeat because John's done a, a number of different meditations and it's all about that heartbeat of life and tuning in and keeping in tune with. So there you go. Uh, by the way, the Be Here Now Network, just one other little thing is uh, we need everybody's support. There's a lot of people working on this to make all this uh, available. And thanks to uh, Magic Mike and other people and companies like that that help support us being able to do this because, of course, podcasts are free. Most of what we do at Love, Serve, Remember Foundation is free. Um, we, you know, there are, there are, there, everyone is ultimately can uh, take advantage of the, of Ramdas and all the other teachers that we have. So here you go. This is uh, Mind Rolling with John Lockley. And it's on the Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and just catch all the wonderful podcasts. And we'll see you next week. Hey everyone, it's Mind Rolling and I'm with John Lockley, an old friend now. Hey, we're getting old, John. But you know, it's been quite a number of years since we met and John is uh, a shaman from South Africa. And uh, I, I should, w welcome, welcome to Mind Rolling. Thanks, Rog. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And behind John is the Kalahari and he's, he'll, <laughs> he'll be telling some stories about that. Um, but, you know, when we first talked, you described, this has a point, it's a little shaggy dog, but it'll have, it'll have a point. You described how it was that you were pulled into the uh, apprenticeship, that you were pulled in by the 
particular tribe in South Africa. And your sort of your antecedents and things that you were doing before, and you know, amazing, amazing stories. By the way, you, everyone, just check out that first podcast that we did, John and I, because mm-hmm. it's 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 really quite something. But how I, I just so my question here is how is that work, which is now what twenty years ago is th- that whole thing happened in that kind of a time frame? I've been in Sangoma for twenty five years. Twenty five. Wow. Yeah, full time, yeah. and that's the tradition. Everybody, Sangoma, yeah. and uh, so yeah. What has evolved for you over that twenty-five year period in terms of your connection to this wisdom, and how it's being disseminated, and how it's in, how has it enhanced your day-to-day life? Shall we say? Well, I think it's quite simple for me, and that's got to do with uh, the wilderness helping people to connect to the wilderness and also shining a light on the state of the wilderness all around the world and, uh, and how people can develop a relationship with the wilderness, with animals, with plants, and how we can preserve the wilderness. But what about just like the... I'm, I'm thinking more of you personally and those, the antecedents of you being an a, a apprentice and absorbing mm-hmm. everything that you absorbed having those incredible dreams, everyone, that's a central part of the Sangoma, uh, what, what Sangoma offers is around dream work, right? Am I, that, that's really a central uh, practice, basically. It, yeah, well, we, we do these ceremonies and rituals to spark your connection to your ancestors, and your ancestors are your spirit guides. And once you have that connection, then you, we all receive downloads from those spirit guides, and they come in the form of visions or dreams at night. And then those dreams are what direct your life and help you with the wisdom of helping other people. Because the whole focus of a Sangoma, a bit like a traditional yogi, um, is to help people connect to the spiritual path, to help people connect to spirit. Yeah. Mm. So, John, I, I don't remember if I told you, but I mm. just got back a week or so ago, a couple of weeks, I don't know, because it was we were at a convention representing Ram Dass's work mm. in Denver called psychedelic science and it was wow. organized by maps you know the the organization that is get you know because the efficacy of of uh, particularly psilocybin and mdma in uh really helping people with ptsd uh, disease death uh, addiction and so on so they're they're really working towards studies that they have done so many studies that prove this works, so the government hopefully will make it legal for a therapist to be able to use it with their patients. So, twelve thousand people were there. Okay, wow. was, <laughs> can you amazing? Yeah, uh, yeah. Now it's a bit of an industry now, quote unquote. You know, this is America. This is what we do, <laughs> right? When something becomes, you know, so much in the in, in the news, basically. So. Um, how and, and I was thinking about you when I was listening to all these like talks and presentations at you know at the convention center and so on. Some of it was really cool, by the way. Doctor Bronner, David Bronner, is is the you know who now runs that company. Um, it's his father who started it. You know the soap company, Doctor Bronner. Yes, I've heard of you that. Know, you, everybody, you, you, know, you go into a place. There's a Doctor Bronner. You know, it's really it's got all yeah. that uh, text on it about spirituality and this, that, and the other. Anyway, he's a major supporter of this cause, and he had uh, one huge two thousand square foot place. Uh, um, you know, ballroom-ish thing from whatever, from uh, the Denver Convention Center. And it was decked out like Burning Man. I mean, it it was like dark and you were like dancing through psychedelic paintings and installations. There was a huge dragon in one place. (laughs) And this where we did our main presentation was in front. It was absolutely apt considering Ram Dass as Richard Alpert. So, (laughs) but more to the point, is the connection, I mean, I know, because of all of our chats, that in this tradition, 
psychedelics are not used. And uh, well, no, what, they are used, but we just they, don't speak about them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, you never told me that. Okay, you did. <laughs> You ruined my whole premise, for God's sake. Uh. <laughs> uh, all right, well, what I'm really getting at, though, is the use of uh, the, 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 the way that dream works, it opens doors. Dreams work. They yes. open doors of perception, right? And... Uh, Psychedelics open doors of perception, and and have you know, and both of them you know, it's lead to an intu intuition that is really important for people to be able to connect with trust and intuition. So, how do you see those two things? I mean, and we've never talked about you know, uh, we've talked a lot about the power of of dream work and, and dream yoga with the Tibetans particularly is a very, very prominent mm. thing. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think, I think the way we work, most of our herbs and plants where we, that we work with as Sangomas are not hallucin hallucinogenic, but there are some that are. However, we, we tend to use, you could say 80% or 90% of the plants are not hallucinogenic. Um, and then there's some plants that haven't been categorized that have this, they call um, door openers and um, they haven't really been studied that much by science. And these are, are what, uh, particular plants to help open the gates of the spirit realm. However, I have encountered people who have got those plants online and it hasn't had much of an effect on them because it has to be done in ceremony. It has to be done in some kind of mindful ritual setting and then things happen. So I suppose I've worked with, I've worked with hallucinogens myself in my own private practice and um, it's been very, very beneficial for me. However, I, I haven't taken hallucinogens just off the bat. I've... I've been instructed by my dreams to take them first. So often really? I've had dreams about particular plants that have then led me to do some research about those plants and find people who are good ambassadors or leaders of, of, of those ceremonies. And then I've gone and taken part in those ceremonies. So if people come asking me about lucidians, I think they're very powerful and they're very good to take if you need them, just like any strong medicine. Um, but for us in the Sangoma world, we, we say it's very important to get the dreams and visions when you're sober, without anything, because you want to develop a strong connection with your soul, with your own connection with your soul, not relying on the spirit of a plant or the spirit of something else. Well, this is a lot of what we talked about, actually what Ramdas represents, because mm. who he, of course, in those days was you know doing the experimentations with going inside and basically he was looking for a map of consciousness but he mm. he would keep coming down which is what you just say said mm -hmm. oh you know it might be a little bit better to have that emanation in a completely sober way through dreams and through visions and inspirations or whatever um, and of course this is and and then a, and doing it in a ritualistic manner set and setting is what you know Albert and Leary was all about in the sixties, and that's they set that whole thing up that way. But once you see, once you have a an experience that just completely opens you up, and and just the interconnectedness of everything is present in the moment. I mean, it's an extraordinary experience. And uh, and it doesn't that of course doesn't just happen through a psychedelic, but many people are using psychedelics, so that's what we're speaking to. But mm -hmm. the fact that there is that ineffable experience in any in any different way through meditation, a chant, through walking in the Kalahari just behind you there, mm -hmm. um, yeah. then it's how to integrate the the ineffable into our day-to-day -day lives. Through what means do we nurture that ineffable experience is the question. That's a great question. 
<laughs> That's a great question. And I think that question is also why traditional shamanic apprenticeship takes so long. Oh. When I finished after 10 years, my parents thought it was a long time, but it was actually just like the average time for a Kosa Sakoma because it takes so long to integrate the body, mind, and spirit. Once you have that spiritual experience from a ceremony, from a drumming, a trance dance, to come down to earth. I mean, I used to experience, when I was doing my apprenticeship, uh, Raghu, I used to give myself at least three or four months of not doing anything. Every year, I would just devote myself to being with my teacher for three or four months. Mm. And I save up and I would just put money aside and just go home and just be with my elders. And the reason is, is because we would do a trance dance from like Friday night to Sunday. And then because it wasn't my culture and because I wasn't brought up with this, I would need about three days to integrate. And during those three days of integration, I would rest, I'd have long baths with herbs, I'd go for walks, I would be spaced out. <laughs> and then on Thursday, yeah. I'd start feeling a little bit more kind of grounded. And, uh, and that's how my, my, my practice went for, for, for 10 years, you know. And, uh, but intuitively, I gave myself that space to not have to go and work and earn a living during that time because I knew that I needed to devote myself to speaking closer, to, to resting. So a lot of the work in terms of integration in my experience was actually resting, sleeping, eating well, resting. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Old-fashioned stuff, really old-fashioned, yeah, no, boring no, stuff. No, you know? no, it's absolutely, <laughs> no, it's absolutely right on. Uh, but that phase is over. Okay, yeah. you've rested, now you're back. You have mm -hmm. to go back, earn some money and do the whatever the worldly family thing is. Mm -hmm. What? How do you carry through this incredible essence so that, because, you know, we're all here human and every day there's a stress thing, there's an attachment thing, there's a clinging thing, there's plenty of opportunities you remember Duncan, of course, Duncan Trussell? Yes, of yeah. course. So he and I have been working on this project, an audio book, where just we discuss back and forth, just like we're doing. Uh, and in this case, it was about Krishnas' thing of the movie of me, which I've shared ad infinitum over these podcasts over these years, because it's been years we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. I think it'll finally show up this fall, but uh, the movie of me to the movie of we... So we take this incredible uh, essence that, that we've gotten through whatever, through whatever ritual, sober, through psychedelics, through whatever it is. We take that and then we nurture it the way you suggested. You know, you spent mm. some real time allowing it to integrate without having to go jump back in and have your mind sucked in by all of the wonders of the uh, material world. Mm. Then what? Well, I, when you're talking now, what I'm thinking of is actually a circle. And that circle mm. in, in my original training was the Zen circle. And, um, and then that Zen circle became what we call the Ubuntu circle. Now, the Ubuntu circle for us means humanity. And the way it works is in, in South Africa, we have this old concept called Ubuntu, meaning humanity. And Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu spoke a lot about Ubuntu. But the old mystical term of Ubuntu is much deeper than what people read about. And, uh, and the term Ubuntu means I am what I am because of who we all are as a community. So basically, if, if the community is struggling, if humanity is struggling, then... Um, then we are all struggling. If one person is, is, is not connecting to spirit, then we all aren't. So it's, it's basically... Bodhisattva putting a vow, right? Yeah, it's putting a responsibility on each person to do their bit to basically help the human race. So as you're connecting with your own soul and your spirit and as you're connecting to your ancestors and making a decision to wake up and connect to your immortality, your soul or your soulful essence. As you're doing that, you are feeding the Ubuntu circle. You're feeding humanity without doing anything outside yourself. You are feeding the human race because it's like a collective beehive, this collective unconscious that we are all connected. 
And all the yogis and shamans speak about that. So there's this point where we come together and we first make that harmony within ourselves, connecting to our immortality through listening to our dreams, through walking our path, through engaging with our spirit. And the next is engaging with our spirit guides and with our ancestors. And then we are creating harmony in the circle, harmony with humanity. And once there is some harmony with humanity, then the next thing is we face the outer circle. We face, we turn outwards, and then we look into the wilderness and see how is the wilderness doing? How are the animals doing? How are the plants doing? What can we do with our consciousness, with our energy to bring about change there? So that's where a lot of my work is, is right now. Um, I'm still doing a lot of outreach work with my Sangoma community in South Africa. But a lot of my work is also now facing the wilderness, looking into the wilderness and the animal and plant world because that is what's speaking to me. Because now that, that, that original teaching and training has found some kind of harmony inside of me and now the next part of the circle is expanding for me and that is going into the wilderness and seeing what needs to be done to stretch consciousness and help bring more healing. Hmm. That's very much karma yoga, it would be called yeah. in India, right? Absolutely. That's wonderful. I was looking at something recently with Ram Das and then also having the privilege of spending time with him and uh, with you at, at um, with with those retreats, the Ram Das Maui, retreats yeah. in paradise in Maui. And uh, people ask me, how do you find your destiny? How, how do you find your life path? And it's very simple, service. And I think mm. Ram Das shows that. I mean, how much can you devote of your time and your energy for no monetary or transactional gain, but just because of love? And I think Ram Das showed that, he walked that, and I think that's why his teachings are so powerful. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, in, in one particular moment in this Becoming Nobody film, he says, when is what you, when is it when, I, what I need is enough. When is mm. it, you know, it's more interesting to serve people, right? Mm. And uh, yeah, so that's a, a major point of, in fact, this thing I told you about working with Duncan on, the movie of me, um, one of the transformational, I mean, we suggested a transformational moment uh, that turns the whole thing completely 360. That's, and so he, he talked about somebody actually going out to feed people. So it's a beautiful little thing from Ram Dass, really about generosity and compassion, mm. you know, which is the fulcrum for being able to get out of the movie of me, basically. Yeah. Yeah, but he talked about somebody, every day they would go down their street and there would be the same person, homeless person, and she diligently gave X amount every week and just did it properly and took care of it. And then she thought, you know what? What is it? I, I, you know, I would invite him up to, to have a place to rest, right? But... I'm afraid he'll take over my life. <laughs> I'm afraid, you know, the fear comes up. Mm. That uh, it, it was the way that he pointed to it, Ram Dass, was just extraordinary. Just how we defend ourselves and protect ourselves mm. as we walk around this world. Which is why, in my mind, like, I mean, we all get called to potentially experience ourselves without that big I. You know, we just get sick of it. We get <laughs> sick of the constant self-interest. So we go to do a yoga class or we go or, or we read, oh, wow, we can go with John Lockley to the wilderness in, in Africa. And mm -hmm. so we have that experience. And then there's no looking back. You can no longer continue to absolutely self, uh, separate yourself the way and defend yourself that way. That's the way I think, anyhow. I mean, I, again, I go back to when I, you know, the integration process happens after a, a, an extraordinary experience. 
But then what? And service is, you know, right at the top of the list. Do what you mm-hmm. can. You've been given something. Share it, which is what Ramdas was all about. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, but there. But you to even get there to maintain some mindfulness is extraordinarily important, which includes meditation. Meditation and walking. You know, walking meditation. I always recommend to people if they're stuck and they're struggling, then just. To have a wilderness walk, you know, just walk around the block a few times for 30 minutes. And it'll be great for your body. And it'll be great for your mind and for your spirit. And uh, and then walk like we do in the bush, you know, with your chin, not too up, but not too down. Don't look in the ground. Look, at, look to the horizon. So your eyesight and your consciousness is lifted up <laughs> rather than looking in the ground and the pavement, you know. I'm sorry, but as soon as you said that, don't look down. I want to look down. There's snakes and shit. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, in in South Africa, I mean, in Botswana, people always have this idea about <laughs> snakes in Africa, and of course yeah. they are. They're poisonous snakes. Yeah. But you're actually very lucky to see them because oh, they really? feel the vibrations yeah, underneath your feet. Out. <laughs> they get out yeah. the way. I mean, we saw two snakes uh, after three retreats last year. I saw two. I mean, this year, I saw two snakes, and one was actually a baby snake. And they're the most dangerous because when yeah. they bite you, they give too much poison. Oh. And, uh, and it got out of the way maybe only at the last minute because Jeez. it was a baby, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. We have that. Well, rattlesnakes, are, they don't seem to go anywhere. You can hear the rattle. And oh, wow. I was just my, with my dog. We went somewhere and I just, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this whoop. Her thing, she goes up straight in the air, four legs. And I go over to see what, it, and it was a rattlesnake. Wow! And and uh, yeah, they don't get out of the way. <laughs> no, we have much wiser them. snakes. You have in Botswana. That's all. <laughs> oh, I'm pleased boy. I don't see too many of them actually, because it's it's kind of frightening when they're so poisonous. Some of them. Yeah. So. No. Absolutely. Mm. Um, so I know, because uh, we have the Kalahari behind us, and I know mm. you did an expedition recently there. Can you give us the details on what that was like? Oh, it was amazing because I had this vision for many years that I wanted to bring, I wanted to bring people into the African bushveld to experience the nature because I see it as the Garden of Eden. It's a place of innocence. It's a place of uh, rebirth, but also a place that has been unsullied by civilization in uh, many places. So the Kalahari is a, is a prime example of that. And, uh, and then as we started making preparations to go in, I also had this, uh, I had this, this vision for, for, for even longer about bringing modern and ancient man together around a, a fire to help revision humanity. And uh, I know it sounds like a, like a very a very, almost a fanciful idea, but I really felt that I wanted to sit with uh, the Kalahari sand bushmen and just just be with them, just be with them as a Sangoma and play my drum and play music and bring in a group from from overseas or wherever and uh, and just sit together without any expectation of them performing their traditional skills or dancing, but just be together. And uh, I have to say that that vision came to fruition this year and I was blown away when it happened. It was just incredible because it was, I did two retreats in the Kalahari and the first retreat. So, can, it, can, John, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm looking because you have a picture behind you up of the yeah. Kalahari. Yeah. And that, so it's really a, 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 a shrub desert basically. So yes, the, it's a shrub But there are trees. Big. I've seen other pictures. There are parts that have trees and stuff, right? Yeah, sometimes the trees are quite large. I mean, this is a particular picture of, of a desert landscape, almost yeah. like Santa Fe or, or New Mexico. Yeah. But uh, there are other spaces where you have quite a, quite a few trees and they, they're quite a bit taller than, than what you see behind me. However, it's quite a dry, barren space. And, uh, but it, what's incredible is the amount of life, the life force there. And it's coming from a sandy soil. So you're looking at probably a centimeter of soil producing this abundant life like the Garden of Eden. I mean, it's quite really? incredible when you think about it. So my sense of bringing people into the space was to bring people into a shrine of nature where they can connect to their own innocence, where they can connect to their own with their own vision of their life and their own purpose. And... Um, 
I've had some amazing stories and experiences with with people coming in. Um, but anyway, this last story with with the with the Kalahari sand, it, it happened this year for me, where on the first retreat, we went into the into the bushveld to study the local plants, and we were guided by the local sand bushman. And then one of the young trackers who had been tracking and guiding us every single day was speaking to his dad, who was one of the sand elders, and they both kind of pointed to me and and this conversation happened and and then he just said Sangoma and then he carried on clicking in his language of the the Koi language, which is like, it's like all these clicks. <laughs> wow. It's very wow. it's very beautiful. Yeah. And uh, so they introduced themselves to me and we spoke a bit. And then the second retreat is where, where things um really took off because the young tracker guy spoke to his dad again when we went into the bush looking for for medicinal plants. And then his dad, the the San Elder, um, he looked at me and he just said to me through the translator, I'd like to see what you do in your shrine tent every day. <laughs> and I said to him, well, you're welcome to come anytime. I said, do you want to come tomorrow? He said, yes, he wants to come tomorrow. And so and the next day... What is the shrine tent that you, you, this you so take created, with you? Yeah, the, in, the, the in shrine the tent is something, yeah, it's something that I make every year. I make a tent in the bush felt and um, it's a place that, that we do prayers, that we meditate and a place that I, 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 I sanctify in a particular way as a Sangoma and a place where we connect with our ancestors. And it's basically like, like going into, into the dojo or the, or the Zen, Zen meditation hall, but it's in the, in the bush felt in the mm. middle of nowhere. So I make this tent every year, and we go in there and we practice. <laughs> so when you take a group out, they stay in one area, go out during the day to other places, something like that? Yes, we stay in a, in a lodge, a very comfortable lodge, so people have a room and uh, they're looked after and we have uh, beautiful meals. And then for two hours every day, we go to the shrine tent, which is, like I say, in the bush felt. And uh, and in the morning when we wake up, we go for these walks, these nature walks where we are led with um, with a sand or bushman tracker and we follow the tracks in the sand and we go looking for animals and we observe the animals, see the animals as the gurus, as the... Mm. as the wisdom of the bush felt and we just watch them and we we follow the tracks in the sand often of of predator of cheetah or whatever animals we come across and then we walk back and have breakfast and then we have a nice breakfast and then we watch mm. the the watering hole and the watering hole will have kudu and other kinds of animals coming in and then we'll go and we'll do the 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 practice with me in in the shrine tent so uh, the Bushman mm-hmm. guy has been hearing about me in the shrine tent playing my drums and singing in, in, in Krosa, which is a similar language but different to the Khoi language mm-hmm. or the San language. And uh, so the, the Bushman elder asked if he could take part and I said yes. And the next day he comes in with I think over 10 of his family and, and, and um, community members. <laughs> mm. That's so great. So we all sat together and it was incredible. We ended up sitting together for about three hours and I played my drum and I sang and then we all prayed together on the ground in the traditional Sangoma way. And they were speaking the the sand language with clicks and then we had people from from America speaking and we had a lady from Vietnam and then we had myself speaking and Kosa and Afrikaans and all these languages. Mm, wow. And in that moment that Ubuntu circle that I'm talking about had found harmony. And in that moment, we were all together because we were welcoming in our ancestors and our spirit guides in the shamanic way. And as that happened, I just felt this kind of beautiful shimmer and movement. And afterwards, I gave a gift to the San Elder, and his name is Klikau, Klikau. And, uh, and as we shook hands and I gave him the gift there was this vulture that came down and it just flew towards the shrine tent and then it just flew over the shrine tent in the exact moment that we shook hands and, and just held each other, you know, mm. with a sense of presence. And, uh, and afterwards I was so struck by this and I thought the vulture symbolizes rebirth and transformation. And uh, so after that meeting, the, the elder, Krikau, he invited me to his village. So it was such an honor to be invited to the, to the Bushman village. 
Mm. And then they also asked me if they could participate in my shrine tent um, next year. And I said, of course, you can come anytime, you know. So that was a real honor that. Wow. So. Oh, that's so great. Mm. What, are, what are some of the, you were mentioning there were some, you had some lovely stories of people's experiences in these journeys. Yes, well, people people speak about some of the dreams they they they've had, and obviously I can't share some of the intricacies of the dreams. But uh, where the simple movement of not speaking and and walking towards the shrine tent for, and then then being in the shrine tent for two hours, then walking into the bush felt on their own, and sitting under a tree with a candle and just listening to the sounds of nature and then lying on the ground. I mean, some people, they just burst into tears. Some people were just crying and, and, mm. um, and it was very cathartic for them. Mm. And uh, for a lot of people, actually, they had no words afterwards, which is a bit hard for testimonials because you can say, these guys <laughs> had such a good time that yeah, right. they got no words for yeah. you, but they had a great time. <laughs> yeah. No, you just say, all I could get out of them was ineffable yeah <laughs> <laughs> all these tears these these yeah. you know these, these long tears you know so mm. um, I think the, the in terms of story it would be really that that connection with the sand and you know from the age of 14 or 15 I wanted to work with the sand and it took oh, me really? all these years to actually be able to 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 get to them and hear the language because we don't have the sand language around us in South Africa anymore. You know, the, the culture is really fading and it's very sad. So you have to really go on a pilgrimage to the wilderness areas of, of uh, Namibia or Botswana, mm. deep into the desert to encounter these small groups. And, um, and they're still living the traditional way, but just barely. And uh, so that's partly why I'm inviting people to join me so that they can have a taste of that Garden of Eden with these people who have lived like this for thousands of years, you know. Yeah. And they're the oldest. Uh, this the Bushmen, right? Are the oldest indigenous in the world? Maybe reputably the oldest and living indigenous culture mm. on Earth at the moment, and um, and they're so threatened by by Western culture and by ourselves in the same way that the animals are being threatened now. So that's why when you asked me in the beginning, what is the movement of my calling now? And it's to really work on that Ubuntu circle in terms of connecting to your soul and your ancestors and then looking at what can we do to help this world, not just help ourselves, not just focus on our own enlightenment or our own spiritual good feeling, but... What is happening around us where there needs needs some some care and some attention and um, and that's what's drawn me into this mm. wilderness setting in the Kalahari. Yeah, extraordinary. Um, and uh, as we went in there, the first retreat, there was a whole problem with the uh, with uh, with a rhino and the rhino poaching, and uh, oh. we came in in one one truck and on the other truck that was leaving the. The lodge was uh, was a government truck, and they had just been called to go in and and cut off the horn of one of the last rhinos with horns in Botswana. So that was very, very symbolic, you know. So they wouldn't get poached. So they wouldn't get poached. So we're lucky that the the the, the rhino in good good condition there, and we were able to experience them and and see them. It's just they don't have horns. <laughs> So hard. Yeah. What, so the human know. family, you know, we talk a lot about human instability and human disharmony and war and racism and all of these things. But as the human world is fighting and, and, and going into this, this disharmony, the natural world is dying. And, uh, and we really need to lift the white flag of peace amongst ourselves and actually face the wilderness now because the, the, the plants and animal world is struggling a lot more than the human world right now. And uh, species extinction is alive and poaching is alive and, and there's many animals that are dying all the time. So, so this is a strong focus of the work right now for me. Mm. I mean, it's happening absolutely everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Even, you know, I'm in California, as you know, and just go to the beach. There are seals dying on the beach and other wildlife, fowl and, and so on, because of a red tide, which is really? because of, yeah, uh, what we've done, what we put into the ocean, the climate, you know, the currents change in a way they're not supposed to. I don't know how it how it gets to be so devastating yeah and we even went to try and tell people there's a couple of seal well one of you know you watch they're dying in front of you they're actually still alive some of them i mean it's just extraordinary what if how do we get here my god i mean yes greed power we start right there and of course Mm -hmm. and uh but we are so uh out of uh rhythm with nature and and it seems to be that uh, i mean and this kind of work that you're doing or anybody doing anything to get get more conscious and be able to share that Mm -hmm. is is hopefully going to be uh what can transform this kind of uh ignorance as if we're separate Mm -hmm. from everything right when I was studying Zen, so my Zen master Su Bong and Zen master Sung Sang or Dae Sun Sinim as we love to call him in South Korea, he used to talk about these times and this was the early 90s and they, they were very prophetic in what they were talking about and what they saw the future and how things were going. And they used to say, a strong I, my, me mind leads to devastation in terms of the environment. And... Um, Mm, how can we they wouldn't talk about reducing the ego as such but just the selfish ego that I, my, me mind is the the mind that is eating the world so how can we create a mind that is a little bit more humanitarian and caring and I think that's the focus on of what Ram Das's teachings and Krishna Das and yourselves and you and (laughs) It doesn't matter what people do in terms of your spiritual practice, but mm-hmm. as long as it's not I, my, me, it's not, it's not, as long as it's not just about you. And, um, and I think that's, that's the point. If people are looking to connect with their purpose, as the Buddha says, the, the purpose of your life is to find your purpose. And part of that search and that pilgrimage to finding your purpose also involves looking into the eyes of a sparrow and a cat, Mm. and a donkey, and a horse, and as well as other human beings who are struggling. And just, you don't even have to ask them, how are you? You should feel, how are they doing? Mm. How are they doing, you know? And then then your practice practice really starts to, to take off. Things start happening for you. I remember the early days of of my apprenticeship and uh, I was really struck by this, this, this dog. She, um, she just had all these puppies and she was a township dog. So township means like Stray living in, the, yeah, yeah, living living in the kind of, kind of rural areas and uh, just living off the scraps of the street. And she was, she was so emaciated and uh, her ribs were showing she was not in a good way. But all she was thinking about was a little bit of food for her, for her puppies. And uh, I remember waking up at nights just with the vision of her in my mind, and mm. and then thinking, you know, what it's almost like a symbol of what's happening to Mother Nature in some ways. But uh, this can all change. We can change the world we see outside ourselves. All we have to do is is change our per- perception of, of things and change our own mind. And just that caring, mindful response of compassion and empathy and then taking the next step forward, that can change things dramatically. Yeah. And there is... Uh, I do some podcasts, John, uh, occasionally with very younger people, next gen and beyond. Uh, one of them is my... Uh, 13-year-old granddaughter Zoe who is like incredibly aware of absolutely everything that's going on from from race to politics to uh, 
uh, environment, everything, you know, the pandemic. She had it all completely a point of view that was refreshing. <laughs> so I've done a few of these things. And, you know, I, I, I find there are a lot of, in that generation particularly, there is a lot of caring that includes uh, environmental issues, animals, and and us humans, as of course. But uh, there's a there's a bit of hope. Hopefully, it's wise hope in that they grow into um, a path that has some fundamental and substantial understanding of oneself. Right? Mm-hmm. There's real mm-hmm. internal investigation to get to the point where you're connected with true self, with that thing, whatever you want to call it, soul, land, Buddha, mind, you know. I'm sure mm-hmm. your tradition has... What's, what's the term in Sangoma for that? kind? Of? Well, we would say it's important to connect with your umoya, that wind inside of you, that spirit wind. Spirit like, what's wind. Your oh, so what's your umoya? How is your spirit that. wind doing inside? Umoya. Okay. Oh, I gotta write that down. Are you kidding? It's so <laughs> great. Spirit, wind, umo, everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Umoya. The wind Spirit. is moya. So you say moya is the wind. And gumoya uh, wam, which just means the wind inside of me. Hmm. Yeah, I th- so there's hope for next gen to be connected to umoya. <laughs> I really think. And of course, many of us, it doesn't matter how old you are whatsoever. Hey, I wanted to read something to you. Because I like really, and this, <laughs> this is our friend. I think you met. Did you meet Sharon Salzberg? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. So she has a great new book called Real Life. It's a wonderful book. Um, but her claim to fame, so to speak, in the Theravada Buddhist tradition, uh, within that is Vipassana, which you know well. Mm-hmm. meditation, insight meditation. And then she's been a big promo- promo- promoter of loving kindness. Mm-hmm. And she does phenomenal meditations that really bring you into a, not just your heart, a shared heart, which is what we're talking about right now. Mm-hmm. So she goes, clearly, loving kindness for ourselves is not always the easiest by any means. And I always urge people to go back to that underlying principle and just switch the order. It's not a problem. Though we may need flexibility, the loving kindness instructions are quite explicit. We have to include ourselves at some point. Even as we may be cultivating enormous care and compassion for others, there needs to be a part of us that is not abandoning ourselves. There is a kind of profound equality of us and other people. To me, that's like, okay, it's all said quite well right there. This is it, right? I mean, uh, I just read something the other day, uh, a quote. I can't remember who it's from. Famous author of some sort. You have to stop talking that way to yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all can be way subtle to very gross, the judgmental, critical uh, ego, that part of the ego, that absolutely can, allowing that to continue. uh, Here's a, this, what Sharon just said, loving kindness is a panacea for uh, stopping that kind of, uh, you wouldn't do this to a friend the way you wouldn't talk to a, a friend the way you talk to yourself. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, I love that passage from Sharon. I think uh, the inner critic is very strong with people nowadays. That's what I've seen a lot with my sessions and mm. engagements. And uh, I think the shadow work that we all are called to do in terms of looking at ourselves, part of the shadow work should be to really work with the shame and the guilt that many of us have inherited, you know, like apartheid South Africa. We, we've all, mm. a lot of us, uh, people, especially the white skin, have inherited a lot of shame and guilt. And that can become a real obstacle to spiritual practice because to come into that space where you 
feel you're a child of nature and where you feel that innocence requires a little bit of work. And to feel that innocence means to not judge yourself. And I think that's that's the beautiful place that Sharon is talking about there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Just simply start there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, we're getting towards the end, but um, we always have you share a meditation. John does wonderful rhythmic meditations, among other meditations, but whatever it is you have at hand or in mind, please, a few minutes, a couple of minutes. Let's connect to the wilderness together. In order to connect to the outer wilderness, We need to connect to our inner wilderness. We need to connect to our dreams, our ancestors, and our own immortality, our own soul. The outer wilderness is struggling. The environment is struggling. There's massive species extinction right now. Life as we know it is under threat. So what can we do? We can drop in and connect to our inner wilderness. It's important, and we all can do it. So right now, let's do this journey together of connecting to our ancestors, our dreams, and our soul, our spirit, that part of us which is immortal, that connects to all of life. So feel your heartbeat. Take a deep breath in. And just drop into that timeless space inside of your own heart and accept yourself. Know that you're a child of nature. You're a child of the Great Mother. Let go and surrender. Feel your own heartbeat. (sighs) Feel your own heartbeat in your chest and just let go into those gentle rhythms like a child in the womb of its mother. You in the womb of the Great Mother right now, planet Earth. Breathe in and let go. I'm going to just sing a chant, an Umoya chant from South Africa. Umoya means wind, it means spirit, it means soul. And as we chant this, then we connect to that deeper space inside of us. So join me. While I chant, you can feel your heartbeat and just let go into that timeless space inside of you. Om Yo Amo Om Yo Amo Him O Yo Amo Om Yo Amo Yo Yo Om Yo Om Yo space inside of you, connecting with the dreams inside of you, with your roots, with your ancestors, and invoking your own spirit to wake up. Great. Thank you for that. It's, yeah. um, I always love your meditations. Um, 
Oh, now, uh, before we get off, though, you're doing, I know you're doing a course that people can attend, correct? Or yes, I'm really excited to to mention that I'm going to be doing an ancestral healing course with the Shift Network. It's a seven-week mm. ancestral healing course, and it'll be online, and um, you can sign up or you can go on my website and, and register for, for my newsletter, but... We're going to be promoting the the first interview with me and and Stephen Stephen Denan from the Shift mm -hmm. Network. Um, that's mm -hmm. going to be in the end of July, and then the course is going to start towards the end of August. So uh, you can keep your eye out on my website. On if you subscribe to my newsletter, it's uh, johnlockley.com. Or spell, you can keep, spell Lockley. L O C K L E Y. Yeah. So John Lockley, L O C K L E Y dot com. Yeah. Or you can have a look at the Shift Network. Yeah. Now go to your site, get it okay. all verbatim. John right Lockley dot com. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it'll be a wonderful course, everybody, if you're especially interested in, in the connecting back to nature, which we are all interested, in, even if it's not mm -hmm. the Kalahari, it might be the little speck of park that has some trees just walking in it right and also your ancestors sending some love and connection and healing to your own family I and mean, that's the essence of it is how can we heal our ancestors how can we heal the human race so first it has to start with our own families our own relationship with our parents and with our ancestors so that's where the course that's where it's that's where it starts mm. oh that's beautiful well, thank you, John, for being here as usual. I miss you. Haven't seen you since the pandemic. Of course, mm -hmm. many people can say that. <laughs> uh, you know, but hopefully it'll happen. And uh, I, uh, you know, always just foremost for me in sharing with people is, mm -hmm. is what indigenous wisdom has to offer us. And we need to go back there and... Uh, reacquaint ourselves with the true connection to this earth so we have real respect and love for it and everyone. So thank you, John. And, thanks, Rocco. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. And this thanks. is Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com. And, of course, we have many, many incredible podcasters there, from uh, Ram Dass to uh, Alan Watts. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking of that because this fall we're doing a we're doing a course after your course of ourselves that's a, with Alan Watts and Ram Dass. Wow, amazing! Yeah, yeah, it should be really cool. Amazing. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.